<laughs> Exodus chapter 18. We have a person in our church, a professional dancer that also used to be in a church as a dance. That's some things that some of the churches do now. And, uh, so that's beyond stepping there. Exodus chapter 18. We cover the first 12 verses of Exodus 18, and this is actually going to bring us to, a, to the conclusion of where some of the things, we'll, we'll do a review later on, but uh, why I took us through the exodus of Israel from Egypt uh, to, to Mount Sinai. And uh, we'll talk about what happens after Mount Sinai, and then uh, review the, the five things that Israel learned after being redeemed and what they should have learned and, and why it's appropriate. Not only everything that we studied, there's an application that can be made for every dispensation, even for ours. Sometimes we have to do it by contrast, but there's an application for each dispensation and particularly for the nation of Israel in end times. Um, there might be, though, that we might uh, not continue this next week. Uh, we might talk about some other things and then come back to it, but... Uh, uh, in fact, I didn't mean to stretch every one of those five topics into two messages, which may, means ten <laughs> messages to teach five things. But each, there, in every chapter that we looked at, at the Exodus, there was things taught in there that we needed to look at uh, a couple different ways or a couple different times. Especially this chapter, verses 1 through 18 leads Israel, they're, they're at the uh, Mount Sinai, but Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, meets them, has a profession of faith. And then after that, we pick up in verse 13, where it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. And Moses' father-in-law saw, uh, saw all that he did uh, to the people. He said, What is this thing that thou, do thou dost to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning till evening. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they, when they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and the other. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou dost is not good. Uh, thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee for, for this for this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, and that thou mayest uh, bring the causes to God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they, mu they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating uh, covetousness, and place such over to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all season. And it shall be that every good ma great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself and they shall bear the burden with thee. And if thou do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened unto the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads of, over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. And they judged the people at all seasons, and the hard causes they brought, before, un, brought unto Moses. But every small matter they judged themselves. And Matt, Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for an opportunity to gather again and realize that all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So instruct us in righteousness today as we look at this passage, uh, both in Israel's context and then what we might glean for ourselves. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I said in Exodus chapter 18, verses 1 through 12, we already seen Jethro 
comes out to meet Moses, brought Moses' wife and his two sons to him. And that's a picture of God bringing Israel out of Egypt. He has redeemed them. He's delivered them from the hands of their enemy as they traveled to the foot of Mount Sinai there. And uh, they come to the mountain of God. And, and, and so God has redeemed them. And the Gentiles now has heard all that God did for the nation of Israel, Jethro being one of those who comes to Moses and talks about he heard all that God has done, how God delivered the nation of Israel, and then he professes his faith, that he knows now that he is the God of gods. And, that, uh, uh, and so he acknowledges the God of Israel. That's a picture of the Gentiles coming to God through the nation of Israel, through the rise of the nation of Israel. We talked about that last week. That is, by the way, when you come to the book of Galatians and you realize that Peter carried a message called the gospel of the circumcision, and Paul preached a message called the gospel of the uncircumcision. Most people have no idea that there's two different messages, both good news, but there's a good news that God's going to bring to this world through the nation of Israel. That's what this is a picture of. Here's Gentile salvation through the rise of Israel. But Paul today preach, preaches a message that through the fall of Israel, salvation's gone to the Gentiles. And, and therefore, this is the gospel of the uncircumcision. Not salvation through Israel, but salvation through the fall of the nation of Israel. Both are true messages. There's only one message for today, and that's the gospel of the uncircumcision. The message of, of the Apostle Paul that goes directly to the crosswork of Christ and points salvation through the crosswork of Christ for both Jews and Gentiles. And that today God's forming the body of Christ. But that was a mystery, hidden God, not revealed until the Apostle Paul comes on the scene. Uh, that's God's grace for us Gentiles today. But back here, when God's dealing with the nation of Israel, that was a picture of what took place, uh, what God's doing with Israel, God's purpose for Israel, in Exodus chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. When you come to Exodus 18, verses 13 through 17, we see Israel now organized into a nation. Uh, eventually, they're going to be a kingdom through which Jesus Christ is going to come back and be king over the nation of Israel and ultimately, not just over the nation of Israel, he will be king of kings and lord of lords as he returns in his second coming. But he's coming back to save the nation of Israel. They're going to be blessed first, and then Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom there in the nation of Israel and stretches that kingdom out over the earth and becomes king of kings and lord of lords. And the nation of Israel is going to rule and reign with him as a holy nation, a royal nation, a holy priesthood. Um, so that's what you're seeing the, in verses in chapter 18, verses 13 through the end of the chapter here. You see Israel organizing into a nation, ultimately into a kingdom. And you see the structure there of reigning over thousands, over hundreds, over tens, over, or over fifties, over tens. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, you have the structure of, 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 of delegating of authority that takes place here as Jethro gives this advice to Moses. So we're going to look at the details of that, but I want you to see this is what the picture is. Here's Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. God has already saved the nation of Israel, delivered them out, has blessed them this far, and uh, now they're going to get his laws after this. But Moses already knows his laws, and here the Gentiles come to salvation through the testimony of the nation of Israel. Um, by the way, I'm going to read this verse to you. We have other verses that we're going to turn to. But when we talk about salvation coming to uh, the Gentiles through the rise of the nation of Israel, Israel will fail God in the future when God gives them the law. They're going to fail to keep God's laws. But that's not going to... God's not going to fail to use the nation of Israel the way he said he would. He told Abraham, I'm going to make out of you, uh, out of you a great nation, and that through, the, through you all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And, and certainly it's through Jesus Christ everyone is blessed. That's today in the age of grace. But God is going to be blessed through the nation of Israel. That is, the nations are going to come to God through a testimony of Israel, in the book of Ezekiel, after God had judged Israel, I just want to read these verses. Some will be familiar with the verses that follow because in Ezekiel 36, God's going to put his spirit within Israel and cause them to walk in his ways and be the testimony that he called them to be. They're not going to do it through the power of the law. They're going to do it through him putting a new spirit within them, his spirit, and taking the stony heart away. But, when, but before that verse comes up, Ezekiel 36 says this, uh, verse 22, it says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, 
I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. God scattered them among the Gentiles. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. See, that's a testimony. That's the picture of what already took place in Exodus, that God was sanctified, set apart as holy, being the God of gods. <laughs> the Gentiles had pagan gods, but they're realizing the God of Israel is the God of gods. And, uh, and, and so the, the coming, they come to, because of Israel, God delivering the nation of Israel, he's sanctified before the Gentiles, and then through the rise of Israel, the Gentiles come. God will use Israel. They're not going to do it through their power. They're not going to do it through the law. That's why we're stopping at this point. From verse chapter 19, there's going to be a failure of the nation of Israel because they're going to declare they can do it. But God is going to, have, is going to accomplish his purpose in Israel by the new covenant that he's going to give them by putting the spirit, his spirit within them, causing them to walk in his ways, keep his laws, and then there'll be a testimony to the nations. But, so here they are, out in the, in the, at the foot of Mount Sinai, and then uh, uh, Jethro here also then says uh, uh, to Moses concerning his judgment that what he was doing isn't right. Look again at verse 13 of Exodus chapter 18. It says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. And Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people. He said, What is this thing that thou do, do, dost to, to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning till evening. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. Uh, uh, when, when they have a matter, they come to me, I judge between one and the other, and I do make them to know the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses here, he, the, these verses, he sat to judge. And the whole point of these verses is that when he's doing this, he's doing it by himself. And the, this, twice the statement, alone. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can get the picture here. Imagine the long lines that were there. When we first talked about Israel leaving Egypt, we realized that they numbered between two and three million people. At least two million are in the adult uh, uh, side of that number there. And uh, so anyhow, there's a lot of people. And there's got to be a lot of problems, you know. You're going through a wilderness, and you, you know, you know, everybody has problems with neighbors, right? And uh, so there's always discrepancies, arguments, things that need to be decided. So here, you got one judge out of all those people. Can you imagine how big that line is? When it says morning to evening, I mean, they just lined up and patiently, well, I don't know if they wait patiently, <laughs> they waited because they had a matter and uh, they can't settle it between them. They have to have Moses decide how to settle it, and so they're waiting their turn. So these long lines, Jethro's looking at this, thinking, man, alive, what a day this is. And, uh, and, and Moses is judging between the people. I think not only all the discrepancies Moses had to do, can you imagine, now we know in our own court system, you have a judge, and he decides. And he says, okay, here's what's got to be done. And then the people leave. Well, the guy doesn't do what the judge said to do. Or he wants to appeal his case. <laughs> So you know in Moses' case, not only is he trying to solve all the problems, the people are going away, and it's not solved every time. So these problems are compounding, and they're coming back to Moses, and he's got to deal with it again. I, I, you can see the headache. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see why Jethro said, uh, this isn't right, <laughs> and, and gives Moses some advice there. So th this is what Moses is seeing. Moses sat the judge. Now there's some other things that are in that passage, though. When Moses explains what he's doing, verse 15, it says, And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. They realize Moses is a prophet of God. They're not just saying, Moses, you're the smartest man around here, and you've got better discernment than everybody else. They understand that Moses was called of God to lead them out. Moses is called a prophet of God. And, and so they're going to Moses for him to inquire of God. So he says in verse 16, he says, When they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and the other, and, and I do make them to know the statutes of God and his laws. 
That's interesting to me because I keep telling you Exodus chapter 19 is where God is going to make a covenant with Israel. In chapter 20, he's going to start giving them his laws. Moses already knows something about the law of God. He knows the way God thinks, probably because he's a prophet of God, so he's got some discernment from God in how to judge a matter. But he knows even before the law is given what's right and what's wrong. Now, we're not prophets of God. We don't know what's right and wrong, and certainly the nation of Israel who weren't prophets of God, they didn't have the discernment to know right and wrong. They're going to Moses, a prophet of God, to know what's right and what's wrong. And so God, uh, Moses, in his judgment, is making them to know these things. So that it is, is for us to realize that God eventually does give the law to Moses. In Exodus chapter 20 through 24 is where the law is going to be given in written form to Moses and the nation of Israel so that everyone can know what is the mind of God in certain matters. What is right? What is wrong? What is moral? What is sin? And it's not a matter of human judgment. It's, it's a matter of God now revealing and putting it down in Scripture, a thing that God would have revealed to Moses concerning what is his statutes, what is his laws, that Moses could, could discern, but the people couldn't. And eventually it's getting written down in Scripture. I've been told, and, and we have a man from our church that uh, has become a lawyer, and I, I failed to ask him this question. I know years ago that every lawyer going through law school was required to read the Bible, not just the law of Moses, to read the Bible all the way through. kind of doubt if that goes on anymore, but I know that used to be a fact, because there is this discernment that's in the scriptures between what is right, what is wrong. You see all kinds of, well, you just see law and even the structure of law, even in the past, just the passage that we're, we're studying here. But it's God's word that tells us what is right, what is wrong. There's also, when Moses said there in verse 16, when they have a matter, they come to me and I judge. Well, you begin to understand something about judgment, that certainly judgment would be morally right and wrong, but sometimes it's a matter of uh, there's a squabble, there's a disagreement, there's uh, some kind of a controversy, and Moses has to settle that. And so judgment isn't always a condemnation type of thing. What, whatever needs to be discerned between uh, disagreement between two people, they're coming to Moses and he's going to solve it. The law is written that way, by the way. When you come to Exodus chapter 20, if you just flip over there, you see in verses 1 through 17 what we call the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And when you go through Exodus chapter 20, if you just look at it closely, what you have is you have beginning, the, the, you have five, the first five commandments in the Ten Commandments relate to God. For instance, I'll just start on it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make, make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commitment my commandments. The first commandment is have no other gods before him. The second, don't make any image and bow down to them. Then verse 7 is the third, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that's the one that's the sign of this covenant to the nation of Israel. Every one of the laws that are in the Ten Commandments, Paul will repeat to us that are right, moral for us to do or not to do, except the Sabbath. Because that's the sign of the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And then, but the interesting, the, the, the last one is, uh, the last one toward God in verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, what I'm, my, my point to you is, in the moral law, there's five that point to God, and the next five have to do with mankind. For instance, thou shalt not kill. That's a sin against man. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's a sin against man. Thou shalt not steal. That's against man. And then thou shalt not uh, bear false witness. That's a sin against somebody else there. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house and, and all his goods are listed there. So those are the five that are toward man. That middle one there, that one in verse 12, honor thy father and mother, 
That actually is part of the commandments toward God because if a child does not respect the authority of a father and mother, God is the one who established that authority. There, that's, that's not honoring God. A child learns to honor God by learning to honor his parents first. So that's a very important commandment. I, I, it, it strikes me because in our study on... What was that? <laughs> trying to think of all the different studies, Wednesday, we were talking about, uh, oh yeah, it was it, when we were looking at the book of Romans in our Sunday school, is that we went and saw how that in past time, there came a time in which men were given over to a reprobate mind, and, and one of the things that was in the list of 23 sins that their mind was given over to was disobedient to parents. Paul warns in the last days, perilous times will come. He lists 20 more things. Some of them are, are pretty close to a match to the, what God gave Gentiles over in the first place. But guess what's still in the list? Disobedient to parents. Which is just part of that ungodliness, departing from God. So anyhow, in verse 20, when you study the, the law here, you're learning what's moral, what's right, what's wrong. In, in chapter 21 through 24, you have what's, what's listed as civil laws. In fact, I, I'll point a few out to you because it's always good for you to know. Like, when I said that God put the law in writing, we don't trust judgment of man. There is no prophet to go to to find out what God thinks about a matter. Moses wasn't telling what he thought. He was telling what God said about a matter. Now it's written down so you know what God said about a matter because if you ask man what, you, what they think about things, you're not going to get the same justice. You're not going to get the same opinion. So, same opinion, that's my point. Man, that's all he has an opinion. God decides what is right, what is wrong, what is moral, what is sin. And it's listed here. Uh, just a couple of the... Just the uh, it's always fun to me just to go through and, and see how... Clearly, these things are taught. For instance, chapter 21, verse 1. Now, these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. See, there's judgments here. These are civil laws, things that they can judge between what's right, what's wrong. Down in verse 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die, he shall surely be put to death. There, you know, the question about capital punishment. Is there a question in that verse? <laughs> See that word, surely? <laughs> now, now, don't forget, we're not talking about you taking vengeance on anybody. We're talking about a government set up, and in Israel's government, under God's laws, that's what needs to be done to keep society pure. Um, verse 15, He that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Wow. See how important it is for a child to honor his father and mother? You get a child that... Uh, uh, who grow up and would actually smack his parents, his father or his mother, the, the guilt, the, the penalty of that is the death penalty. Verse 16, He that stealeth a man and selleth him, or he that found, uh, the, he, he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. <laughs> That's solved kidnapping, won't it? You, you know, just put him away for a little while, he's gone. Uh, verse 7, 17, He that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Not only, not only hitting them, but even cursing them is a death penalty according to God's word. Look over verse 22. See if this doesn't sound like something you could discern, thinking differently from what society says. If a man strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, miscarriage, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely, uh, he shall he shall be surely punished according to the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine and if any mischief follow then shall shall thou give life for life eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot burning for burning wound for wound stripe for stripe the mischief that follow looks to me that especially eye for eye, tooth, you know, life for life. The mischief that follow, if the child is born premature, if he lives, then there's just a punishment to the man. If the child dies, then the man is life for life. The child died, the man dies. Which, that would tell you something what God thinks about abortion, wouldn't it? Clear matter there. And then we've been pointing these verses out just because of the time that we're living in and 
what society says about things as, uh, as you go through um, uh, Do I have those marked? Well, look at chapter 22, verse 1. It says, If a man steal, uh, if a man shall steal an ox or sheep or kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox or four sheep for a sheep. Now, boy, that's the way to deal with a thief, huh? Instead of the thief, you know, the people steal nowadays. I always get a kick out of it. Well, I don't get a kick out of it. Some of these people steal millions of dollars, and their penalty for stealing millions of dollars is five years in jail. Would you go to jail for millions of dollars for five years? I mean, that's, that's a pretty good deal. Who makes, who makes you know, a million dollars a year, and if you, they're going to pay your, they're going to feed you, they're going to clothe you, they're going to give you free medical, maybe some education and you get to keep the millions you stole. You know, because you hide it away. That's the idea. You don't have it anymore. But anyhow, that, that would stop a thief. It goes on to talk about uh, verse 2. If the thief be, fo- if the thief be found uh, breaking up and smiting, he shall die. Oh, that's, that's protecting your property. There shall no blood be shed for him. So you catch the guy stealing, and you protect your property, and the man dies, no blood shed there. Verse 9 uh, it says, for all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox or for ass or for sheep or for raiment or for uh, any manner of lost thing, which another uh, challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, whom the judges shall uh, condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. So anyhow, you see what some of the judgment, the civil judgments are about. And by the way, when you get over to chapter 24 and uh, through through uh, 31, it is all the ceremonial. We're not going to go through those, but that's how Israel, God's going to set up what's called the Jews' religion. And, and all of the religious activities, I have a phone message where a man called our church, I'm not sure where he's from, I'm not going to be able to call him back right away, left a phone message, and what he wants to know, he says, I just don't want to know, Israel had all these feast days. We as Christians, are we supposed to keep all those? What a good question. I don't know who the man is, what, why he stirred that way, but, but he realizes that when he reads the Bible, Israel had all kinds of feast days. God had a religion for them. They had a tabernacle. They had sacrifices. They have altars. They have all these things. God established a religion for the nation of Israel. I'm saying all that to you because there's only one religion God ever gave in the Bible. It's the Jews' religion. When God turned from the nation of Israel and turned to us Gentiles, he didn't establish a religion. You realize how institutions have been established, and they look back at Israel's religion, they say, oh man, we've got to have a sanctuary. We've got to have an altar. We've got to have feast days and holy days. And they they start inventing, they they take everything and and, 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 uh, uh, counterfeit what God gave to Israel and say we have it, when that's not at all what God is doing today. You read Paul's epistles to find out what God is doing today. So, anyhow, that's what the law was all about. But my other point about this is, when Moses sat to judge, and I said, you learn something about judging, judging isn't always a matter about sin. Now, I think everyone we looked at so far was, but sometimes you have to discern between problems. And I say this to you because come to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. It says in verse 27. It says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I, verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, now catch this, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my name's sake, 
shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. So people are going to, who, and, and you know, realize Israel is going to go through the tribulation for, the, for my name's sake, the name of Jesus Christ, they're going to have to forsake some, some family members, they're going to have to forsake some lands, they're going to have to forsake money. Not only will they inherit eternal life, but they're going to also uh, receive a place of reigning with Christ. They're going to uh, receive a hundredfold. They're going to be rewarded for, for the things they suffered for Christ. The twelve apostles who followed the Lord, they're going to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, if when Jesus Christ comes back, and he puts his spirit in the heart of the nation of Israel, why would the twelve apostles have to judge the twelve tribes? They're, they're all going to be walking in God's laws and keeping his commandments. But see, judge isn't always in the sense of condemning for something wrong. Judging sometimes is assigning responsibilities and, and solving issues that come up between responsibilities. There's going to be a government set up. Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to be king. And the twelve apostles are going to sit under him on twelve thrones. And they're going to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. And the nation of Israel is going to judge and reign over the nations. And so that, that's the structure of the kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back. Now I say that to you so that you understand what they're going to judge and it might help you understand this. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And Paul's condemning the Corinthians because them being carnal, they're not putting God's word, especially the word of God's grace in their mind so that they can think like God thinks about situations and make discernments that would match God's understanding and discernment about a matter. And so Paul scolds the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, Dare any of you having a matter, a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? So within the body of Christ... We're supposed to do some judgment. We're supposed to discern when there's a problem between two saints. Rather than go to law, to lost people, and ask them to solve a problem, you're just supposed to go to saints. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Twelve apostles are going to sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What's God's purpose for the body of Christ? Seated with Christ in heavenly places. And Paul says, don't you know you're going to judge the angels? You're not going to judge sinful angels. You're going to judge, you're going to be placed in a place of authority where you're going to be responsible for a certain number of angels or territory that to reign over. That is, the ones who are going to be rewarded. He goes on to say that how it is that we should be able to judge things. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. That is, those who aren't going to be you know, covetous or partial to someone else. I speak to your shame. Is it, uh, it is so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? For brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore, it is, uh, uh, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Yea, ye do wrong, and defraud, and that your brother. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be defrauding your brother, and your brother shouldn't be taking you to court toward the unbeliever, but might have to take him before another believer. And, and the way that sometimes things are resolved is, is to take it, not, maybe not just one, maybe the elders need to hear a cause between two people to solve a problem from going to war between, going to war, going to, to law between each other, to let the elders decide and then do what the elders decide to do. So anyhow, because what the point is, is you ought to be able to discern from God's word how to handle a situation. And, and if there's no way to handle it except the defrauding of another person, just let it go. Uh, we've always said, by the way, when it comes to money matters, 
One of the ways that you can actually practice that, if a brother borrows some money from you, never loan more than you're willing to give that man or woman. Because if they don't pay you back, you are willing to give it. And, uh, and that way you don't have to, oh, I have to take you to court, get my money out of you, type of thing. Anyhow, I, I just wanted you to see that judgment. Moses sat to judge. Then, then Jethro comes along and sees what Moses does, and he gives him advice concerning that judgment. So go back to Exodus chapter 18. And when I told you about the back of the bulletin, the difference between, um, between opinions and debating about opinions, that that's, that's resolved when there's a verse, there's a matter that comes up when Jethro gives Moses the advice of you know, delegating some of this authority and not doing it by himself. I heard messages, I've been, I remember the first time sitting in a church service where the preacher was preaching on that passage, how this was ungodly, carnal advice given to Moses that Moses shouldn't have listened to. I thought, man, I, I didn't read that, I didn't see that in that verse. Then I've heard men talk about that this is good, this is, this is the structure of the nation and all, and you can see what I'm saying is, one way or another you're going to see Israel is being structured as a nation as they come out here, and, and that some look at this and say, it's godly advice. In fact, someone who's listening either through streaming video or, or the audio, emailed me on Friday. I'm, I'm done with my message here, what I'm going to teach. Emails me, says, oh, I, I enjoyed your message about Jethro last week, but I have a question. His advice to Moses, I've heard that it's been good, good advice or bad advice. What, what's your opinion? I told him, tune in. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and it's not a matter, I'm going to show you a verse that it's good advice or bad advice. You're going to see Moses takes the advice. But some things that, when I looked at it, if you look at verse 19, he says, Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, and that thou mayest discern the causes unto God. But he seems to be emphasizing that, you know, this is, give them God's truth. <laughs> uh, so so he's, he's, it's, he's recognizing God, at least in that verse. But even if, if that verse doesn't say it, if you get down to verse 23, it says, If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all the people shall go to their place in peace. Yeah, they won't be all riled up from sitting in line all day long in the hot sun. <laughs> but, the, but see, he says, and God command thee so. He said, Moses, ask God if this is what you ought to do. And if he commands you, then do it. Well, we're going to read on. Moses is going to do it. So I'm not so sure that it's negative advice, but I can't answer the question either way. But you do know that God is taking Israel and is structuring them into a nation. Uh, remember last week when we talked about Jethro, his name? It means eminence like preeminence, that he's called the priest of, of Midian. And, and the idea there is that he has some kind of authority. He has some kind of uh, authority in, in, in the, the area of Midian, and therefore he knows something about leadership. And so he's passing on advice uh, through his experience. But again, it's all, he's all, he keeps saying, make sure that this is what God would have you to do. So, but the point is, is Israel's out in the wilderness. They're redeemed. They're from, Israel, from Egypt. In Egypt, they were slaves. Now they come out into the wilderness, and when they come out into the wilderness, God promised Abraham he was going to make out of Israel a great nation. Well, they're numbered, and that nation will ultimately become a kingdom. They need structured. They need organized. And one of the things that's happening in this wilderness now is they're being organized into a nation that will ultimately be a kingdom. Moses, in fact, is a king among them. That's why they're all going to him. Look at Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. And look at verse 4. It says, it says, Moses commanded us law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, and he was king in Jeshurun. That's like Israel in their, being blessed. When the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. So Moses was like a king, and they're going to have heads of the tribes of Israel. Numbers chapter 1 
Israel immediately takes, and by the way, they're at the foot of Mount Sinai in Numbers chapter 1, in the second year that they came out of Egypt, and Moses appoints a head of every one of the tribes. How many tribes are there? Twelve. So Moses is a king, and then there's a head of every tribe, and they're called over there, I think it's in verse 6 there, uh, maybe it's verse 16, anyhow, in Numbers chapter 1, they're called the princes of Israel, principalities. So you got a king and 12 princes of the nation of Israel. You're here in Deuteronomy, look at, look at over in chapter 32, this is really toward something, a point I want to make at the end of the message. It says, and I, I pointed this out to you before, just a striking statement in verse 8. It says, when the Most High divided the nations their inheritance. Now remember Israel, Moses gave Israel the inheritance of their land. It says, when the Most High divided the nations, that's the Gentiles, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Well, why did he do that? Because the nation of Israel, the number of the nation of Israel is twelve. So he divided the nations in the earth in the number of twelve. Because the nation of Israel is going to rule over the nations. And so God, Jesus Christ is going to return and be king. And the twelve apostles are like the princes of Israel. They're going to sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But the tribe, twelve tribes of Israel is going to reign over the Gentiles. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Look a little ahead. Exodus chapter 19 in verse 6. It says, Ye shall be therefore a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And even though they failed under the law, God under the new covenant, Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests. That is, they represent God to the rest of the people, but not, not to the nation of Israel, because they're all going to know the Lord. That's to the Gentiles. So they're, they're, that, my point to you, as Israel is in the wilderness and being structured as a nation, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus Christ comes, they're being structured into a nation. In Numbers chapter 11, i got all these verses, but I know we're not going to have time to look at them. Numbers chapter 11, that's actually a passage where Israel, years later, begins to complain again about, quail, about uh, uh, manna and want quail to eat. And God's actually going to plague them in, this, in that judgment. But before that, Moses actually turns to God and says, Lord, this is too much for me. Kill me. Take my life. Because all, I mean, can you imagine 40 years of taking care of all these people in the wilderness? And he says, it's too much for me. You know what God does, t tells him to do? He says, appoint you, appoint you seven elders in Israel, and I'm going to take the spirit that's upon you and put it in them, and they'll help you. So God not only has Moses... And then they have the 12 princes of each tribe. Eventually he points 70 others that are going to have the Spirit of God to help them, help Moses lead the nation of Israel and put up with all the grief that he's got to put up with. Hold your place here. Come over to Luke chapter 10. Jesus Christ has already appointed 12 apostles that he named apostles. But when you come over to Luke chapter 10, it says in verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before the face of every city and, uh, and place whether he himself would go, would come. And by the way, he gives them the power to heal and cast out devils. And so in verse 19 it says, they come back saying, Behold, I, I give, he said, Behold, I give unto you uh, power to tread on scorpion, uh, serpents and, and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any, mean, by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, but that the, spirit, uh, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. My point to you is he takes 70 others and empowers them. That same structure. The Lord is king, 12 apostles, 70 others, and uh, ministering in the nation of Israel. The structure that's being set up in the wilderness 
later is the same structure the Lord is setting up for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, two things we've got to cover here. Exodus chapter 18, verse 20. It says, now this is the advice of Jethro. He says, And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and thou shalt show them the way wherein thou must walk, and the work that they must do. So, don't you, when Moses is going to prepare the nation and, and, and delegate some authority, first he's going to teach them ordinances and laws, so that the people know what God's word is to them. Israel's under the law. Then, then show them the way in, where, that it should walk. Be a testimony to them. Be an example to them. And then the work that they must do. Be an example of not only the way they should walk, but the work that they should do. Well, let me tell you, as a member of the body of Christ, God has some of those same things to say about you and me. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the threefold work of the ministry that, that today that there, it's for the edifying of the body, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But, but Paul writes to Timothy and tell him to be an example of the believer. So it's not just in word, but it's also in deed. And, and then he tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. So that if you want to be responsible, first you need to know not the law God gave to Israel, you need to know what God said in his grace to you and how you're to live under grace. Then you should show yourself an example of that, walk that way, and then get busy and do the work that God called us on us to do. And that, that's what we would do today. So uh, principal application there. Then in verse 21, it says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. What kind of men? Such as fear God. Men of truth, hating covetousness. And then you place them in a place of authority. Those four things, able men, that's men that's already been instructed, now they know God's word and God's ways. Able men. When you, when you, the office, if any man desire the office of bishop, one of the requirements is apt to teach. He's been through the doctrine, he's able. Such as fear God. Well, you know, as we as believers, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says that we're to perfect holiness in the fear of God. So, as a, as a believer, one that, that reverences God properly, that, that's what we ought to be as well, especially those that would take places of leadership. Men of truth. Well, you can't get that without rightly dividing the word of truth, can you? Even a deacon in a local church is supposed to be one who holds the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. They have to understand the truth of God's word rightly divided to have that type of position. And certainly hating covetousness, not, not covetous. That's what it says about an elder, uh, because you're not, this has nothing to do with money. So you, you, you make sure that money is not, it, certainly if you're a judge and you're covetousness, you're going to be bought. And, and so covetousness is not something that even spiritually in a, in a local church. But this is Israel organized as a nation. We're not organized as a nation. We're a body of Christ. And, uh, and, and a local assembly, but some of the same principles apply. And then there's that place of authority, and my point to you is, th is this, is Moses is going to take the advice of Jethro gives him. Verse 24, so Moses hearkened unto the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said, and Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads over people, Rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, and they judged the people at all season and heard the cause that uh, heard the causes they brought unto Moses. No, I'm reading it too fast. And they judged the people at all seasons, the the hard causes they brought unto Moses. But every small matter they judged themselves. And Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. So Moses took his advice there. And, and my whole point to you is this is a picture of the nation of Israel, blessed of God, now being formed into an, uh, 
a, a nation who is ultimately going to become a kingdom in which when Jesus Christ comes back, he rules as Lord of Lords and King of Kings over not just the nation of Israel, but over the nations. Revelation 2, the promise to those that overcome that they're going to rule over the nations. Revelation chapter 3, those that overcome in the nation of Israel, they're going to sit with Christ in his throne uh, as he sat down with his father in his throne. Revelation chapter 20, when there's the resurrection of those that were beheaded for the testimony of Christ and who will reign with Christ for a thousand years, those people are going to reign with Christ as kings and priests for a thousand years in, in, over the nation of Israel in the earth when Jesus Christ comes back in the second coming. The contrast to that, let me close. Ephesians chapter 1. Last week everybody came to me I had a big closing verse in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, and I didn't tell you chapter 5, and everybody came and said, where was that verse? Where was that verse? And it was me. I told you at the beginning. I couldn't wait to get there. And when I got there, I didn't bring you with me. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Understand, we're not the nation of Israel. We don't replace the nation of Israel. God's purpose for the nation of Israel is to make them kings and priests on the earth and establish the reign of Jesus Christ on the earth over the Gentiles, for a thousand years and then it goes on into eternity after that. God's purpose for the body of Christ is the heavenly places. So when Paul prays for you and me in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to read the verses, you study them. Verse 15 says, Wherefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love to all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus Christ's exaltation in the heavens is to make him far above all principalities, might, dominion, uh, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. That's rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, rulers of fives. There's a chain of authority up there in the heavens. And just like there'll be that chain of authority here on earth, that same governmental structure exists in the heavens and you're called as a member of the body of Christ to be set to set with Christ in heavenly places and judge angelic thing, the angels in heaven. That's God's purpose for the body of Christ. You can read Revelation 12 right now. Satan and his angels are there. Read Revelation chapter 6. Satan and his angels are there, but they'll be cast out and God has a people that's going to replace them. Are you one of those that could be able, that would be in the fear of God, someone who is not covetousness, covet, covetous, someone that can be placed in a place of authority, well, God will determine that, and based on your faithfulness, and the things that you've taken into your life here, and lived out in your life, will be the means by which God will give you a place to reign with Christ in the heavens. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the study of your word to see what your purpose is for the nation of Israel and realize that despite their failure, you will not fail them. You will cause them to be blessed the way that you intended them to be blessed and use them the way that you promised to use them. And that, Father, we who have trusted you in this dispensation of grace, that you have a purpose for us, that in Paul's epistles we can read and understand and learn to walk and please you uh, according to your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for another fascinating message. Let's stand and sing our little chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes up.
upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You are dismissed.